it's a real story that the Islamic cemetery on the other side of this eastern gate was built in a purpose to prevent Messiah from entering the gate. <laughs> I thought it's just a good story for two guys invented, but no, it's a real uh, historic uh, story. Anyway, the gate that you see here today is not from Jesus' time. It was built by uh, Caesar Heraclion uh, in 638 AD uh, at the Byzantine time or the end of the Byzantine time. Okay, uh, and maybe right under it, still buried, the gate uh, from Jesus' time. Maybe one word about this, the Eastern Gate in Jesus' time was not used by the common people. It was used only for two purposes. On a Day of Atonement to take the escape goat to Azel, to take the escape goat to Azel, in the wilderness. or very rarely when they burnt the red heifer. So only in those two occasions they used this gate. Jesus, just like everybody else, probably most likely entered the temple from the southern side, from the southern stairs. Okay? The second coming, and that's what we want to read, we believe will be from the eastern gate. Which, by the way, with regard to the scapegoat, it's, you know, Christians often have a very shallow understanding of the whole sacrificial system. They think all the sacrifices were for atoning of sins. None of the sacrifices that took place in the temple were to atone for sins. None. The only, the only thing that would, had, like, atoning element is the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And they lay hands on him. He is released into the desert. There's things called sin offerings, and they more pertain to ritual purity and sort of like accidental sins along the way and this type of thing. But in terms of actual atonement, so that's why a lot of people go, but if they ever rebuild a temple, it'll be evil and blasphemous and... And because Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice, and you go, yeah, for atonement, but the vast majority of the sacrifices have to do with priestly ritual purity and this type of thing. So it's, that's just an interesting thing to point out. Ezekiel 44, verse 1. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary. So this is sort of a whole visionary experience, which faces east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall remain shut, and it shall not be opened, and no one shall enter it. For the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore it shall remain shut. Only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the vestibule of the gate, and shall go out by the same way. By the way, the prince, who is the prince, is quite a controversial topic in, um, in Ezekiel um, 40 through 48. You know, references quite a few times because you go is it Jesus have to be returns but then again it says he has kids and so there's some weird things there um, some arguments can be made that it's the Messiah others that it's not that it, there'll be someone the prince and, you know so but still interesting so the fact that here's the statement this shall remain shut I would argue that it's really ultimately referring to the millennial period after Messiah returns um, but it's still interesting that this at least has remained shut, sealed up for, I don't know how many, many years. like that. It's the typical shape of a few short ones and then a longer one. Short one and longer one. Those are typical for ritual bath. You need to baptize to immerse yourself fully in living water to wash away your impurity. So what Gibson says that the sheep are not real sheep because sheep don't like stairs. People do. Those are actually baptismal pools. Another late research by Dr. Gurevich, David Gurevich, 
In Jesus' time, there were five gigantic drinking water pools and two huge ritual pools. One of them is the Pool of Siloam by the Shiloa Spring, enough for thousands of people to be baptized. And the second one was right over here. So imagine those stairs to be from all four directions and thousands of pilgrims could walk into the water on one direction and come out on the other direction and they come pure. And interesting that on those two locations, where was Jesus was preaching when he was in Jerusalem? At the temple, at the pool of Siloam, and here. Why he did his miracles right over here? Back then there was no Twitter, no Facebook, no TV, no radio. If you want to do something that everybody will see, that will be the place for the pilgrims to gather at the temple and both those baptismal pools. So this is what we read about in the Gospel of John. During the early Roman time, no churches were built. The Romans didn't allow it. The first churches were built on the Byzantine time, the 4th, the 5th and the 6th centuries. When the Muslims came, on the 7th and the 8th century, they destroyed all those churches. Crusaders invaded to the land on the 11th century, 12th century AD. They rebuilt those churches. 200 years later, 13th century, the Muslims came back, late Arabic time, and they destroyed those churches. And then on the second half of the 19th century, during the Ottoman time, when the Christian European powers had a lot of influence over the Turkish Empire, they got permission to rebuild them. One more time. Byzantine built. Early Arabic destroyed. Crusaders rebuilt. Late Arabic destroyed. And then being rebuilt one more time in the second half of the 19th century. This is it. This is the whole history of all the churches in Israel. <laughs> okay? This is an exception. You see this big bridge over here? There was a huge Byzantine church from that end to that end, commemorate the miracle in John 5 that was built on the pools of Bethesda. What happened to this church? Destroyed by the Arabs. What happened next? Crusaders rebuilt it. So the church that you see here in our level, that's a Crusaders church that was rebuilt. But the Crusaders built two churches. One to commemorate the miracle in John 5 and another one to commemorate the traditional okay house of anna and joachim the parents of mary the mother of christ what happened next the muslims came and destroyed that but here we have an exception this church the acoustic was so amazing and it was so beautiful so the muslims didn't destroy it so it's still standing over here from the crusaders time they just turn it to be an Islamic studying center. And if you look up there, you can see the French flag. Because as we said before, on the second half of the 19th century, the French government had a lot of influence over the Turks and they got permission to renovate it. And it's in the hands of the French government today. And it's called the White Brothers from Africa. And they are very kind, they allow each group to sing one song inside. So after those long explanations... ...regardless as to which tribe they came from, and in many times it's used to refer to all of Israel. So people get real hung up on terminology. It was a Jewish feast, it was an Israelite feast. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, verse 2. Now, there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which I, I always love the, um, the root word, Aaron pointed it out, Beth is house, and then we say, but it's chesed, oh, did I say it right? Grace or, you know, the compassion and grace of God, so Beth, chesed, Bethesda is where 
which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Think of that. I'm only 37. <laughs> and 20. I, I, I'm only 37, 20 years ago. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. So the idea, the belief was that you had to get into the water to get healed. When the water is stirred, and while I'm going, another one steps down before me. So wouldn't that stink like you're paralyzed and like whoever gets in first gets healed and you're like, me, me. And then like all these people like run over you to get in first and get healed. And you're like, <sighs> And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. Just with a simple sentence. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. I'm just going to leave it right there. Let's gather in real close.
today. Uh, I, biblically, I think you can't argue otherwise. On the other hand, I think people take it way too far and act like it's guaranteed. It's a mix of something. Okay. We don't have to run for sure. Does everyone else hear that or is it yes. just me? No. <laughs> I don't even need to run We'll talk about it in a minute. This, okay. is just, this is just an exercise. Oh, okay. Very good. So anyway, I'm done. I just wanted to, to say that, like, to emphasize the fact that within the church, theologians debate is the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God yet or not, not yet. And the, the reality is the overwhelming biblical emphasis is it's not yet. It's yet to come. The emphasis of all of the prophets, of John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, it's looking forward. It's looking forward. And that's why it's rooted in hope, waiting. The righteous throughout history have been defined as those who wait. Those who are waiting, those who are hoping, those who are longing, those who are yearning. And again, that's why I love that, that cry, Maranatha, come. It's, it's, an, it's an awareness that things as they are now are broken. Things should not be this way. We're not supposed to die and get old and et cetera, et cetera. Corrupt politicians, you like sickness, you name it. That's all coming to an end at a particular point. So.